Hi there folks, welcome to Doc Talk. I'm sure glad you joined us today. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson here from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University. We're gonna have a great show. Dr. Matt Meisner is gonna be joining us today and we're gonna talk about dehorning cattle. Something that's very common practice, something that all of us have done or continue to do. Stay tuned and I hope you enjoy the show. As dependable as the sunrise, in dairy parlors, open pastures, on ranches and feed yards across America, a place where reputation is more than a name, where the science of healthier animals is a way of life. It's the responsibility that drives who we are and what we do, every decision, every day. It's your livelihood and our responsibility. Closed captioning brought to you by AgriLabs, the perfect pairing of performance and value. This segment brought to you by the new Hired Hand Portable Cow Sprayer. For more information, visit cowsprayer.com. Hi there, folks. Welcome to Doc Talk. Dr. Meisner, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here again. Folks, this is Dr. Matt Meisner, and he's a friend and colleague here at Kansas State University's College of Veterinary Medicine's Veterinary Health Center, and he is an assistant sorry, associate clinical, you got that promotion, associate <laughs> clinical professor here in, in our uh, veterinary health center and he's boarded in medicine for food animals and we're talking about dehorning. Right. Very common. Something that uh, anybody on a, on a cattle operation has seen or probably performed. Um, from the time you're a young whippersnapper you see things happen and uh, it's one of those absolutely necessary procedures um, in a lot of cases to have done um, for various reasons. I think that first one we always think about is safety. You know, your my safety, veterinary safety, producer safety, um, but not just uh, the people and we also talk about the cattle as well. So you bet. their pen mates, um, maybe even the dog or any other horses or anything else that might be around. So other animals, anything that can get uh, traumatized by these horns um, need to be gone. And they can use those then to, to gore another animal and, and uh, you know a lot of people will say that we have horns to protect our animals from predators but there's a lot of pulled cattle out there that raise good calves too. Absolutely yeah um, think of it as a as a protective uh, part of the body but um, and yes I have seen some cattle that had horns didn't have horns and kind of moved down on the pecking order in the herd but um, as we all know, they're plenty uh, defensive and protective with a lot of other appendages of their body too. So it's not yeah. necessarily absolutely needed to protect uh, calves. So safety and handling are one, but let's, uh, what about economically? Well, economically, we talk about, you know, the trauma that you would think you'd see, but uh, bruising, you know, bruising and carcasses and uh, just bumping up against each other on those kind of things could lead to you know, trim and extra different things that would happen to the carcass that, that it's slaughtered. You know? I've actually seen some of the reports saying that uh, shipping animals to slaughter with horns versus pulled, that we can have anywhere from 0.2 to two pounds of trim. Right. So could be a significant a from, from bruising. Um, what about sometimes, you know, I see some of these, the horns will grow around and grow into the skull. Can those be an issue for the animal? Yes, um, they continue to grow. They don't stop just because they hit skin and hide. And uh, they uh, just continue to dig into skin and whatnot and we have to remove them. And sometimes they just grow abnormally. So uh, that's a possibility. Um, and then even just the facilities to handle them. You know, so we have to remove those so they don't knock them off um, going through chutes, alleyways, those kind of systems. Right. So safety for the animals. 
So, and then of course the last one was the surgical or what some people term the cosmetic dehorning. Yeah, um, sometimes we talk about cosmesis, but I do it more oftentimes to close skin to prevent flies infection from setting in. So we remove the horn and then close it back across. And so yes, it seems cosmetic, but has a function too. Cool. Well, I think those are some great kind of leads us off, gets us started on why we do it. When we come back from the break, we're going to talk a little bit more about what different types of techniques there are for horn removal on uh, cattle and how we do it without causing a lot of pain. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back after the break. This Prevention Works Minute brought to you by Beringer Engelheim Vet Medica, Inc. Hey folks, welcome to our Prevention Works Minute. This is an outstanding segment and I'm really glad that we're getting to do this when we talk about preventative medicine for cattle. Biosecurity is important and a good key component to that is vaccination. When we vaccinate an animal, one thing you need to understand is that they do not work immediately. Matter of fact, it takes 7 to 14 days before the animal, once it's vaccinated, to actually start having an immune response that produces an antibodies that are specific for a disease in which we would vaccinate them for. So if I vaccinate a calf for IBR, it's seven to 14 days before that animal is protected or has antibody to neutralize IBR virus. Once we get out there to 14 to 21 days, the body has memory cells for IBR. That's why we give them a booster and we get that booster in our tighter response. Vaccines don't work immediately, but they're really good for prevention. Say this is a calf that's been run through the chute a few too many times. Going through the chute stresses cattle, causing them not to eat like they should. Luckily, Pyramid 5 plus Presponse SQ provides proven protection against key respiratory diseases in a single shot with just one trip through the chute. Talk to your veterinarian about Pyramid 5 plus Presponse SQ, and soon your calves will relax and eat like a whole different animal. No matter where, no matter why, the Veterinary Health Center at Kansas State University is committed to providing quality patient care to animals and exceptional customer service to their owners. From routine checkups to emergency and specialty care, our world-renowned specialists and experienced professionals are here to discover, to teach, and to heal. Let us know. How can I help? How can we help? If my calves start healthy and stay healthy, I've got a good shot at making money. That is why I trust Clostrix. It gives my calves the protection they need until their own immune systems kick in. Calf raisers trust Colostrix Colostrum Supplements. Colostrix is USDA licensed and proven effective. When your money is on the line, trust Colostrix. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Hi there folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University and we're tickled that you joined us today. I'm joined by Dr. Matt Meisner who's a veterinarian and boarded in internal medicine. He's an associate clinical professor working here in our veterinary health center and we're talking about dehorning cattle. And when we left for break, we were talking about different reasons and I think a lot of people know why we, why we dehorn these animals, but now let's get into kind of the, the, the meat of the, the situation here and talk about the different techniques that we're going to use. Right. I think first and foremost we want to make it as um, quick and efficient as possible. And, uh, Probably the most efficient and quick and easiest way to do it would be to take the horns off before they become mature. And uh, that'd be a disbudding type procedure. So that's before, that's while they're still, when they're young and the, you grab the horns and they're still moving with the skin, they haven't um, secured down to the skull. Sure, yeah, it's almost a little smooth, leathery button um, on a lot of calves. And, and we can take those off just by damaging what makes the horn um, before huh. the bone grows. And, and we can do it with things like dehorning irons, which get hot, you know, and burn around that bud. Um, there's some paste, they're kind of caustic that you put on that destroy that, that, uh, that area of horn. And uh, little gouges and various methods to remove that bud quick, easy, um, off um, before it has a chance to mature. Um, oftentimes, 
bleeding is minimal, if any, um, and quick. How, uh, you know, when you're looking at that keratinized tissue, how far out around from that that horn do you need to get? Oh, a small bud. You know, we're getting out. Uh, it's nice to be a quarter, eight quarter inch outside that bud. You know, um, kind of hard to see it. There's kind of sort of a little raised bump, but you want to be outside of that area. Um, then, then let's move into the, some of the different things that you're going to do. Once that horn's attached to the skull, and now we have horn development, there, we're moving into different types of techniques. Yeah. Same thing goes, we still have to get outside what's making the horn. And what it actually is, is a piece of bone covered by um, horn. And so it's following that bone, bone up and we have to get that tissue that makes the horn. And uh, there are several ways we can do that. Um, we've got probably the most common one would be a gouge or a Barnes type dehorner, which um, the horn fits within it. Um, we open the, the handle and we crush and, and take the horn skin and butt off that way. Um, we have various types of dehorners that will um, chop, trim, you know, guillotine types. Yeah, dehorners. keystone. Um, the keystone type, uh, really large horns. Um, we've got those. Um, and now let's, we probably need to back up a little bit because these are, this is dehorning. This right. is taking the horn the clear horn. off and getting the keratinized tissue, getting a margin around that, that horn and, and taking the whole thing. Right. Bone, horn, um, everything around the outside comes off with it. So yeah, that's a dehorning uh, method. And the other one which we showed about, we had wires. You know, we can use yep. OB wire or wire saws to cut those off. And uh, those are nice to get really hot and actually cauterize as we go through. Any of these dehorning methods um, will have some bleeding and we can use these burners or different ways to heat cut it to, um, to, to cauterize those vessels. But those are big dehorning, taking the entire thing off to the base. Um, then we have the tipping methods, where basically you're taking the end of the horn, um, where we're going to leave part of it, we're not going to take it to the base. Safer, less bleeding. Well, when we look at uh, many of these different methods, different ages, different animals, um, some complications can, can occur. So when we come back from the break, let's talk a little bit about some of those complications and we'll return right after the break. Some call it a come from behind victory, an unlikely win, a reversal of fortune, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. This is our moment, our victory dance, because we choose confidence. We choose Zuprevo for BRD treatment. Ask your veterinarian to prescribe Zuprevo. Zuprevo is a fast acting, long lasting BRD treatment that you can count on to get the job done. Choose confidence. Choose Zuprevo for Merck Animal Health. No matter where, no matter why, the Veterinary Health Center at Kansas State University is committed to providing quality patient care to animals and exceptional customer service to their owners. From routine checkups to emergency and specialty care, our world-renowned specialists and experienced professionals are here to discover, to teach, and to heal. Let us know. How can I help? How can we help? Do your cattle struggle with pink eye, BRD, or another disease? Contact Newport Laboratories for a customized solution. Our custom-made vaccines are produced using the specific diseases found in your area. These USDA licensed vaccines offer potential cost savings on vaccine and labor. Contact your veterinarian or Newport Laboratories the next time your cattle are in need of a custom solution. Newport Laboratories custom-made vaccine because every situation is different. If my calves start healthy and stay healthy, I've got a good shot at making money. That is why I trust Clostrix. It gives my calves the protection they need until their own immune systems kick in. Calf raisers trust Colostrix colostrum supplements. Colostrix is USDA licensed and proven effective. When your money is on the line, trust Colostrix. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Hi there folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University and we're tickled that you joined us today. 
I'm joined by Dr. Matt Meisner, who's a veterinarian and boarded in internal medicine. He's an associate clinical professor working here in our veterinary health center, and we're talking about dehorning cattle. And when we left for break, we were talking about different reasons, and I think a lot of people know why we why we dehorn these animals. But now let's get into kind of the 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 meat of the the situation here and talk about the different techniques that we're going to use. Right. I think first and foremost, we want to make it as um, quick and efficient as possible, and uh, probably the most efficient and quick and easiest way to do it would be to take the horns off before they become mature, and uh, that'd be a disbudding type procedure. So that's before, that's while they're still, when they're young and the, you grab the horns and they're still moving with the skin, they haven't um, secured down to the skull. Sure, yeah, it's almost a little smooth, leathery button um, on a lot of calves, and and we can take those off just by damaging what makes the horn uh, before huh. the bone grows, and and we can do it with things like dehorning irons, which get hot, you know, and burn around that bud. Um, there's some paste, they're kind of caustic that you put on that destroy that that uh, that area of horn, and. Uh, little gouges and various methods to remove that bud quick, easy, um, off um, before it has a chance to mature. Um, oftentimes, bleeding is minimal, if any, um, and quick. How, uh, you know, when you're looking at that keratinized tissue, how far out around from that, that horn do you need to get? Oh, a small bud, you know, we're getting out. Uh, it's nice to be a quarter, eight quarter inch outside that bud, you know. Um, kind of hard to see it there's kind of sort of a little raised bump but you want to be outside of that area um, then then let's move into the some of the different things that you're going to do once that horns attached to the skull and now we have horn development there we're moving into different types of techniques yeah same thing goes we still have to get outside what's making the horn and what it actually is is a piece of bone covered by um, horn and so it's following that bone, bone up and we have to get that tissue that makes the horn and uh, uh, there's several ways we can do that. Um, we've got probably the most common one would be a gouge or a Barnes type dehorner which um, the horn fits within it. Um, we open the, the handle and we crush and, and take the horn skin and butt off that way. Um, we have various types of dehorners that will um, chop, trim, you know, guillotine types. Yeah, horns. keystone. Um, keystone type, uh, really large horns. Um, we've got those. Um, and now let's, we probably need to back up a little bit because these are, this is dehorning. This right. is taking the horn the clear horn. off and getting the keratinized tissue, getting a margin around that, that horn and, and taking the whole thing. Right. Bone, horn, um, everything around the outside comes off with it. So yeah, that's a dehorning uh, method. And the other one which we showed about, we had wires. You know, we can use yep. OB wire or wire saws to cut those off. And uh, those are nice to get really hot and actually cauterize as we go through. Any of these dehorning methods um, will have some bleeding and we can use these burners or different ways to heat cut it to, um, to, to cauterize those vessels. But those are big dehorning, taking the entire thing off to the base. Um, then we have the tipping methods where basically you're taking the end of the horn um, where we're going to leave part of it, we're not going to take it to the base. Safer, less bleeding. Well, when we look at uh, many of these different methods, different ages, different animals, um, some complications can, can occur. So when we come back from the break, let's talk a little bit about some of those complications and we'll return right after the break.
If my calves start healthy and stay healthy, I've got a good shot at making money. That is why I trust Clostrix. It gives my calves the protection they need until their own immune systems kick in. Calf raisers trust Colostrix Colostrum Supplements. Colostrix is USDA licensed and proven effective. When your money is on the line, trust Colostrix. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council. Improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Matt Meisner. We are both from Kansas State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. And Matt is an associate clinical professor, works in our referral clinic, and also does some, some haul-in ambulatory work here at Kansas State University's Veterinary Health Center on many cattle. And we're talking about dehorning. We've gone through the whys, the hows, the pain-free. And now let's get to some of the problems that can occur. Well, first and foremost, we always think of hemorrhage or severe bleeding, and uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, you don't wear your nice clothes a lot of times when you're doing these kind of procedures. And uh, um, so there's a lot of bleeding, and we're going to take every precaution we can to control it, whether that's actually find the vessels and twist those down or use some powders to help a clot form or heat, you know, hot irons um, can cauterize, cauterize it, yep. you know. So, so bleeding would be far and above um, the quick, the immediate thing that we're going to do. So we could prevent that by doing them early on, you know, very little bleeding, or we just take some precautions to take care of it at the time. And I think that's the key. If you're going to dehorn, do it as early as possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Quick. I think uh, people are, would be amazed to know that 50% of the dairy cows are born with horns. Right, right. You know, but right. you never see a horn in the parlor. No, no. And, and they take care of them as babies. As babies. So, I mean, we do that on a routine basis at the dairies, man. Yeah. So, take care of them. All right. Back to back to the issues. But one of them that, that we see, too, is, is flies, right? Right. So, after we take care of the horn, we're going to have an open wound. It's going to have to take time to heal. And flies laying eggs lead to maggots. And uh, um, so, fly control, repellents, those kind of things to prevent uh, infection that way. Um, and, uh, you know, the wound itself can get infected, but I think flies are a big hindrance. And so that's the situation where we might go back to a surgical dehorn where we can remove the horn and then take the skin and suture it back across the wound. Um, a lot less likely to get infected or flies. And I think that, you know, flies carry a lot of different bacteria that people yeah. don't realize, E. coli, salmonella, and probably some of our pathogens that, that'll set up some of these, these infections of the wounds. Sure. Yeah. Um, about the sinusitis, and I think this is the one that kind of, you know, when you're opening up that sinus uh, with a dehorn, we can have some issues here. Sure, and it's, it's an ascending, so now we're getting even deeper than just a superficial wound. It seals over, that hollow horn or those vessels travel right into the front part of that forehead of that um, bovine and uh, can set up an infection, sinusitis sets in, headache, and then we have a now, a, just a pus-filled sinus and, and uh, really difficult to treat. I mean, I, uh, you can see some discharge from the nose occasionally, but you'll see them um, occasionally head pressing in a, in, a, in a wall or a fence, just like you would with a sinus headache. And uh, hard to treat, um, we try to get that drained, but we try to prevent that by uh, getting good drainage antibiotics and wound care early on. So, yeah, clean equipment and work with your veterinarian. Right. Thanks for being here today. Glad to be here, fun time. You did a great job. Folks, remember, always work with your local veterinarian. And if you want to know more about what we do on Doc Talk, you can find us at DocTalkTV.com. Thanks to Dr. Meisner for joining us here today. Lots of things to know about dehorning. Work with your local veterinarian. Thanks for watching Doc Talk today. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson, and I'll see you down the road. Closed captioning brought to you by AgriLabs, the perfect pairing of performance and value. Doc Talk was brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the science of healthier animals.